Meantime, uranium price is trading around 15-year highs, and the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF is benefiting from the bullish move. The ETF up more than 41 percent over the past six months. John Champaglia is the CEO of Sprott Asset Management. He believes uranium prices will triple. What time frame are you talking about, John? Triple. Well, that's a bit. That's a big call. I don't know about triple, but. Um... We've clearly gone up about uh, 150 percent in the last two years, and we think there's more room to go. And the reason for that is, is quite simple. We have a, a major supply deficit that is building over the next coming, not just few years, but decades. And that's really a function of having a lost decade where we did not invest in this technology. As a result, we did not invest in a lot of mining, which, which obviously the, is, is part of the, the key part of the story in terms of the, the fuel for the nuclear power uh, fleet that is growing around the world. And at the end of the day, the only way to increase production is through higher prices because these are capital intensive projects with very long lead times. Uh, and that capital is starting to come back into the market. So we pay very close attention to the, the commodity price because that's the key signal that we look for. Hey, John, it's Tim. Uh, thanks for joining us. I, I share bullishness. Uh, I'm long. I'm long the space. Uh, I do think prices are going to double from here. And part of my thesis is related to I, I think there are people that are short in the market. I think there uh, I think there are both producers and some customers. Uh, any thoughts on some of the technical elements of this because of some of the lag times in the industry uh, and where, uh, frankly, a, a lack of a, a lot of liquidity in the spot markets has left us. I think, you know, we're as thin as we've been in 15 years. You heard this from Cameco. They didn't really, they talked more about the fundamentals of the industry, but you get some sense that one or two of the major producers also may have some deficit. Yeah, it's a very uh, a vulnerable uh, supply chain, and it's because it's, it's very concentrated in a few countries and a few companies. Um, and the market right now is very tight. It's very tight in the spot market, but more importantly, the term market is what we, we look at very closely because that's where utilities are buying uranium under long term contractual arrangements. If you look at last year, for example, uh, utilities around the globe purchased through long-term contracts about 125 million pounds. That's great. That was the highest amount we had in 10 years. But we're nowhere near re annual replacement rate, which basically means utilities continue to draw down inventories until they hit about 150 million pounds of annual procurement. This year, we think we're going to shoot through the 150, which is a very bullish sign. It means utilities are essentially restock restocking their their inventories of uranium why because they're feeling very bullish about electricity prices government support that's shifting back for nuclear power because of decarbonization energy security and also grid reliance a lot of people i think are going to start to understand that when you add a lot of renewables to your grid it becomes inherently unstable and so you need reliable baseload power which uh, nuclear power provides, and obviously with zero greenhouse gas emissions. So a very powerful combination that I think the market is realizing. If we want to uh, fill this supply deficit, as I said, it's, it really comes down to opening new mines, restarting previous mines that have been on care and maintenance for, for, for the greater part of the last five or six years, and building new mines is, is a pretty long, long uh, timetable in terms of bringing new production to market. Just to be clear, John, when you talk about deficit, you mean the current market, including Russian uranium? Because if the U.S. and Europe actually sanctioned Russian uranium, what would that then do to the market? And do you ever see that as a possibility as geopolitics, you know, continue to, well, not get better? Let's put it that way. Yeah, I'll break that down in, the, in two parts. So right now, if you add up all of the mines around the world, we think we're going to get to about 150 million pounds of annual production in the next 12 months. The annual requirements for all the 434 reactors is 180 million pounds. So we're already operating with a, with a 30 million uh, pound annual deficit. If you look at the World Nuclear Association, they're expecting the annual requirements in 2040 to be almost 300 million pounds per year. So we're talking about a serious increase in production that, that will have to be filled if we want to build all the nuclear capacity that the world endeavors to. With Russia specifically, they're not a big producer of uranium, but they're a key player in the fuel cycle, the nuclear fuel cycle, around the conversion of, of um, U-308 to UF-6, uh, which is basically a gasification process, and then the enrichment of uranium, where they control about 40% of the global capacity. This obviously has Western utilities and governments concerned, and right now there is a very strong effort to reshore 
some of these steps in the fuel cycle back to friendly countries. So you have uh, you have facilities in the United States and, and France that right now are in the process of growing their capacity so that we're less reliant on Russia. There are absolutely no sanctions whatsoever on Russia on anything to do with uranium or nuclear fuel. And it's a simple reason that we do not have the capacity in the West to cut them off. It's a matter of time before sanctions come into place. The current bills floating around the House are envisioning 2028. But between now and then, we're still going to be relying on, in some part on Russia for, for the fuel cycle. John, thank you. Nice speaking with you. John Champaglia of Sprott.